Exactly. We live. We live. We live. We live with this right here. Yes, sir. Let's get it. What's good, everybody? This is DP with TRPT Change of Direction, Episode 3. I have my boy Tyler Patman right here and my boy Jeremiah Hatch. So I'll refer to him as T-Pat and Big Hatch most of the time. But this is two of my guys. These are two of my guys from KU. Uh, T-Pat played corner at KU and Oklahoma State. Big Hatch was at center, guard, tackle, everywhere when he was at KU. So we're going to talk to them a little bit about their careers on and off the football field. Hatch was more into real estate when he got off the field uh, after college. T-Pat played in the league a little bit, and now he's in the real estate a little more as well and got that going. But first, we're just going to, like I said, thank you all again, but we're just going to talk about what first got both of you into sports. So we'll start with you, T-Pat. Like, was it? Football, basketball, baseball. What was your first sport, and how did it, how did it happen? Was your is your parents a big inspiration on it, or was it you know you was watching Michael Jordan or somebody right. that really got you going? Um, well, actually, my first sport was baseball. Okay. Um, I can't tell you how I just got into baseball first. You know, we start off just playing outside, outside on the street, backyard, in the fields, playing football, basketball, whatever we could play during the day, man, but um, started off playing baseball, went to basketball, and football was actually my last sport. Okay. Um, so just being, I mean, in that community. Man. Well, when, when did you when did you get into football with it being your last one? Was it still super early, or did you get into it at middle school, sixth grade, or were you still real young? in uh, fifth and sixth grade. So that's actually, especially in our time, that that's pretty late. You know, I, yeah, so I oh, started yeah. playing when I turned, was right about before I turned uh, six years old. So that's super, oh, yeah. you know, flag, you know, yeah. five or six. You got some four-year-olds out there. Nah, so Yeah, dudes be serious, man. They be getting into it. I see little ones doing tackle football now. But, yeah, I, I missed a few years of football. Um, I couldn't tell you why. I don't know. It's just something that I always thought I was going to be a basketball player. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I started with baseball first and then went to basketball. And then um, football came alive for me in sixth grade. That's when I really found who I was in that sport. So, a uh, question on that. So, a lot of parents al- always ask me, like, is starting in fifth, sixth grade, middle school too late? Did you have a hard transition? Like, since you did start later for a so, like, I started at six years old. So, football is football until you start tackling. Right. So, you didn't get to say play football and flag. You went straight to tackle. Was it hard to transition against some of the kids that had been playing tackle? Yeah, well, the thing that's the, that's the thing too. When I started playing, I started playing quarterback. Okay. So, you know, I didn't play on the defensive side till middle school, which it was hard kind of transition, just learning how to tackle, um, getting the angles and all that. But, I mean, if you're a football player, you're a football player at the end of the day. Yeah, um, that's true. You know, the big thing with, with tackling is just not having that fear. Yeah. You know what I mean? Once you get over that fear and make a few tackles, somebody hits you in your mouth, then – Everything else take care of. Yeah, I, I started corner at KU, and uh, I always had that fear. <laughs> <laughs> I was one fifty seven. So, I, hey, so I wasn't, I wasn't tackling nobody. I was tripping a lot of yeah. people coming around the corner. So, so with that being said, Big Hatch, what got you into sports? Like, what was your first sport before we started? You over there dribbling the basketball and stuff. Like, you nice. You know, I was on that court. <laughs> like you, you was, Escalade hey, Junior over there. So, hey, I was on that court first. Now, honestly, basketball was my first first love. Um, I played little league for the Trojans uh, out in Pleasant Grove. Everybody say Pleasant Grove. We used to smack y'all, the Mesquite Boys. Trojans. Then we formed what they call Dallas Elite. You've ever heard of Dallas Elite? One of the we were the first Dallas Elite teams. Yeah, I was point guard. You know, <laughs> big, big, big dribbler. You know? Big dribbler. So I basketball, basketball was the first love, and then football came next. And football okay. was more of it didn't take effort for yeah. me. I was just instantly good. Yeah, I was like you know playing every position. You know, I was in the trenches early. So you was a quarterback. No, I, I wasn't. Okay, then. I don't, I'm about to say, don't get on my show line, bro. Don't get on my show line now. I wasn't a quarterback, but I could do it if they needed me to do it. I was booby. <laughs> no, I understand. No, okay. But I, I got played you. D tackle and um, offensive line, and man, I just fell in love with it, you know. Okay. Um, yes. That was at about six or seven grade. Okay. So late. So, so we'll go skip forward a little bit to high school. Like, what sports did you play in high school? Like, uh, obviously, football players, our coaches in high school, yeah. aren't everybody to run track, right? So, right. did you do? Did you keep playing baseball, or was it just football, track, basketball? What did you do in high school? 
Yeah, I mean, I stopped playing baseball at a young age. So okay. About the time that I started playing football, I stopped mm-hmm. playing baseball. <clears throat> um, and then um, in high school, I was playing football and basketball and running track, of course. Okay. And um, my sophomore year was the last year I played basketball. Okay. You know what I mean? It's just one of them decisions. You know, I was five, five eleven. 5'10", whatever you want to call it. I'm about to say, you only 5'9 <laughs> right now. How was you 5'10 at 8'11? Ain't, no ain't no 5'9. Ain't no 5'9. But um, it, was just a, it was kind of a business decision. Exactly. You know what I mean? And, you know, luckily I was I was blessed enough to have my pops in my life, and he kind of talked to me about it. He didn't he didn't come to me, like, with a decision, like, you need to decide if you want to play football or basketball. But he was like, look, this is how I see it. You know what I mean? You can take it how you want to. Yeah. You're right. So, you know, I had to make the decision, man. I'm going a, I'm to a go ahead and stick strictly to football so I can have that all season to get in the weight room and still run track um, and get ready. So I knew that football was going to take me to the next level. So, so that's actually kind of my <clears throat> exact thing that I talked about in the first episode mm-hmm. was that I actually was on JV basketball. And then they were told me told me I was going to start varsity my sophomore year of basketball. But I'm only 5'8 right now. Yeah. And I was like, I, I'm not going to play next year. So I stopped after my freshman year, yeah. knowing the trajectory of the right. sport. Like, that's one of the sports that really limits you, no matter skill, mm-hmm. set height-wise. So, oh, yeah. I, so I jumped out. So that school that you, you know, you had that same type of thing because a lot of guys don't understand that at some point you got to be real with yourself. Yeah. <clears throat> Having fun and taking away from something that could actually pay for, you know, your future. Right. <laughs> like, go to the wreck and play if you yeah. like it that much, but don't take away from your future if you're not really that guy on the yeah. court. It's a, it's, it's a thin line, man, because, you know, I kind of look back at it, and sometimes I wish I would have kept playing. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it was good for me, like I said, to get in the weight room and, and put on a little bit of extra weight and get ready for the next season. Um you know, but but nowadays, man, I kind of feel like we make our kids grow up a little too fast. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like eight, nine years old. Look, you're only a football player, yeah. or even in not even that, they're not even saying you're a football player. They're saying, oh, you're only going to be a you're quarterback. Like, how are you know your son going to be a quarterback? Right. He's taller than everybody now, and then he could stop at five ten, exactly. or he's short and stubby. So you're trying to train him for a mm-hmm. lineman, and then they grow up. You know, or even basketball, what happens is I see these tall kids, right? They're yeah. taller than everybody, so they say you're a center. Right. Well, by the time they stop growing, they're five. Uh, right. I mean, um, six four. Well, now you're a point guard, but yeah. have no, you no know, skill. no skill. Yeah, bro, it's, it's tough. It's, you know, what I mean, like I got a little sister. She's a she's a freshman in high school, and she um, she's a good volleyball player. Okay. And she pretty much plays volleyball year round. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I kind of feel like kids are starting to get burnt out by it. Exactly. You don't mean playing one sport the whole time. You know, you play everything, bro. It's going to correlate to whatever sport you play. Being you know an athlete. I mean? Yeah, being an athlete. You play basketball. When you play in defense, that correlates to playing DB. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? When you, Corey talked about that. Yeah, when you're playing baseball, it's eye-hand coordination, bro. You know what I mean? So everything's going to correlate, bro, and it's going to make you a better athlete. It's going to make you a well-rounded athlete also. So. Exactly, exactly. So you can slide the mic back on over there for the hatch. But uh, what did you play in, in high school? In so high obviously school. football, you was at Dallas Carter. What what high school were you at, T-Pat? Mr. Ridge. And that's in? Um, City Park, Texas. Okay, then. Yep. And then Big Hatch was out there in Dallas Carter. Y'all seen him on Friday Night Lights <laughs> and everything. So, yeah. But go ahead and tell them about uh, what you played in high school. So in high trans, school, man. I played basketball, baseball, and football. Okay. No, you know what? I played baseball in middle school. High school, I only played basketball and football, and I okay. threw the shot put. Okay. Yeah, so um, I think, honestly, being a lineman, for a lineman, everyone was like the – I remember my high school coach was saying, hey, why are you playing football? You should be in the weight room. Um, and I was like, no, nah, I like I like basketball. Yeah. You know, I want to play basketball. Well, when I got to college, I was the weakest lineman. Mm. Mm-hmm. When I got there, yeah. you know, instead of doing the off season of football, I was on the basketball court thinking I could play basketball. Exactly. You know, so and were you like so? Everybody think they nice, but like, did you ever think you even had a chance to play college basketball? Never. So, so that's one of those things we talk about, right? Yeah. So you come up to KU, and you're the weakest lineman. but you didn't even think you had a chance to play college basketball. But you knew you were going to play college football. And you gave up, you know, that could have been like you could have went to KU and maybe never played, right? Because it's like, 
I'm giving up an opportunity to do something that I'm getting paid to do just because I like it. And I don't even think I'm ever going to be good enough to play. So, but you just said, so it was just a love for basketball and you just wanted to do it. I just wanted to do it. You know, I suffered tremendously for doing it. But it also, like he said, with correlate, I was able, I was also able to get quick feet. Because you, you played every position on the line. Every position yeah. on the line. So yeah, it did about, correlate with yeah. that and just understanding that being an athlete is being an athlete. Exactly. No, 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 that's true. So we'll move forward a little bit with that. So let's talk about, so we all play ball at KU together. We'll talk about like recruiting, like how was your recruitment out of Dallas Carter Hatch? Were you one of the nation's top? Were you just a middle guy? Did you have a lot of offers? What kind of was your recruiting process like? So out of my class, I had the most offers okay. out of my class. What were your, what were your top three to five schools? I had the entire Big 12. Okay. What made you want to go to um, Kansas? So I sat down with a guy named Anthony Collins mm -hmm. and a guy named Akeem Talib. Yep. I don't know if they, Two All -Americans. if they remember this, but we went to Applebee's, and they basically was telling me, like, hey, look, your first year you need to get all state. Your sophomore year you need to get – you know, they basically was telling me what I needed to do to get to the NFL. And that was the first person – those guys were the first guys to tell me, like, an actual plan on how I can get to the NFL. The other guys was trying to take me out. Oh, you, I went to visit. Oh, you, they were, like, trying to take me out and have a good time. But I wasn't – I'm trying to get to the NFL. You're trying to get to the money. Yeah. So, so that was a big key factor because we know OU's obviously way bigger than KU as a program. But you felt like KU was more aligned with your thoughts. Like, these guys trying to have fun. I'm trying to get to this money. So was that – um the biggest key factor was just like how the, the guys were approaching you during the recruiting trip? Yeah, I think that was the only factor given the KU at that time. They were looking to be good, but they weren't good. Exactly. That When you got there, time, the Orange Bowl came after you were Correct. there. Correct. Once I got there, my freshman year, mm -hmm. that's when we won the Orange Bowl. Exactly. And then the following year, we won the Inside Bowl. That's when I got up there was Inside Bowl. Yeah. So I think it's just a, a factor of the people, the guys, people like J Mac, you know, D Fine, you know, a key putting up good numbers, mm -hmm. you know, people like that. You're like, I, I want to get behind these guys. Exactly. And then not to mention Doss, you know. <laughs> one of the best trainers out there. Yeah. So what about you, T Pat? Where where was your recruiting? Were there a lot of offers? A nation's top guy? Where where were you at? No, I was um, kind of a mid level guy. Uh, it was a three star. Okay. Um, and my high school was actually just in the, I want to say, when I was a freshman coming in, it was only the third year that my high school existed. Okay. You know what I mean? So I was actually the first D1 football player to come out of my high school. Okay. So nobody before me had offers. Um, and I was the first guy. My first offer was Iowa State. And then Kansas came right after that. And um, I went to Kansas, man. I met with Mangino. And just like kind of what Hash saying, just seeing the atmosphere, being around guys like you, you were my uh, yeah. my host. Yeah, um, hey, I, the one, when he say that, that boy DP <laughs> was like seven or seven. I got everybody. I got everybody. Nobody no. that I hosted didn't come up there. But go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, but it was just kind of like a – it felt like a brotherhood when yeah. I came up there. Um, and, you know, just for me that was big because I'd always moved around a lot as a kid. Okay. Um, so, so to be in a place where it felt like family before I even got there – was big for me and um you know like I said seeing guys like Akeem, Chris Harris, um just Stucky, seeing those guys in the secondary um is something I wanted to be a part of um you know I feel like I probably should have waited a little bit longer because yeah. they offered me March of my junior year and mm -hmm. I committed like a week later okay you know what I mean and um what did that have a lot to do with uh Kansas being cool now right they had just won the Orange Bowl we went to the Insight Bowl, so we were getting better. Like, yeah. did you feel like, hey, they're like, you know, like, it? I don't want to miss out on them because they are looking like the trajectory is going up at the school? Yeah, I mean, that was part of it. Um, that was definitely part of it. Another part of it was, like you said, kind of not so, not so fear from my part, but kind of like my family's part. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just coming up as a family – 
you want to take you want to take advantage of every opportunity you have, right? Exactly. So uh, my family looked at it as an opportunity, like, man, you need to take this, mm-hmm. or you know, what I'm saying the next week I was going to go to Iowa State. Yeah. And as a young kid, I'm not really thinking fully. I'm like, man, I ain't trying to go take no visit to Iowa State. Mm-hmm. So I might as well commit to KU. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? So it was kind of like an immature decision on my part, um, but I, I was I was okay with it too at the same time. So, um, like I said, the family atmosphere played a huge part of it, though, bro. So, you know what I mean? I ended up – I love the, the decision I made because that, that was a big part of my life for sure. Cool, cool. So, we're all up in Kansas uh, at the, the same time. And well, I'll start with um, UT, Pat. When you first got there, um, our coach was Coach Jackson. Mm-hmm. And I remember at this time I was uh, starting corner yep. when um, t Pat got there. And Coach Jackson, I, w- I was this guy, you know what I mean? He would be like, hey, what's going on in mm-hmm. summer? How are guys looking? What are the new incoming freshmen looking like? And um, I remember I was like, hey, man, we got a freshman, Tyler Patman. He's going to be the real deal. I was like, he's a little raw right now, but I was like, his quick twitch is there. He's aggressive. And I was like, his attitude as far as you can't beat me. I'm going to keep going, keep going. I don't care if it's Des Briscoe. Me and you going at a DB drill, DP, like, I'm going to compete. Right. And that was the first thing that I really noticed about T-Pat was, like, that dog he had in him. And um, I remember Coach Jackson was like, okay, okay. So, you know, we went through, you know, off season, and he started doing some really good things, and they started seeing him. I know your first year, did you redshirt your first year? Mm-hmm. So I know you ended up red shirting, right. But we all saw that you had that dog in you, mm-hmm. right? What kind of led – to that, like, where'd you get that mindset from? Um, I mean, I just had it since I was a little kid. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's my grandma, bro. I grew up with my grandma as a, as a young kid, and I just always had that that fiery, that attitude about myself. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was just I had that will, bro. I always wanted to win. I always wanted to compete. Um, you know, I always wanted to be the best. I don't know. It's just something that was just kind of in me as a little kid. You know what I mean? Exactly. And um, as I grew older, man, I started to hate losing. Yeah, and that was a big part of it. You know what I'm saying? We're going to get into that. We're going to get into that. that. <laughs> but, no, nah, man, it was just something that I thank God kind of blessed me with. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's a gift. It can be a gift and a curse. Exactly. Um, you know, I'm, I'm quick to trigger, you know what I mean, and I'm, I'm quick to compete. But, um, yeah, it was just something I was kind of born with, man. So everybody that meets me sees it. So. Yeah, no, it's easy to see. It, it jumps off of you, jumps off your body, jumps off the screen when people watch you play. So that was, like I said, the first thing that kind of attracted me to to uh, you when Coach Jackson was like, who's my guy, right? Yeah. There was other juniors there. There were seniors. I was only a sophomore at the time mm-hmm. going into my sophomore year, and he was like kind of asking me, like, you know, what's what? So that was the first thing that attracted me to you. The first thing that attracted me to Hatch <laughs> – I was in my house every day after I committed to Kansas. I would literally go on MySpace, and I was watching the KU freestyles, big hats <laughs> jumping on the track. So yeah, that, that was – that, that literally – that's, that's where, when I first seen Hatch was literally when they used to do all the freestyles in the dorm rooms and everything, and you know what I mean, and all those guys, AJ, Bean, you know, uh, D, man. man, the whole crew – that used to go hard on in the in the towers. So that's when I first seen him. Then I got to actually meet him, right? It's another guy from the Dallas area. Didn't know him, but Carter, we all know Carter. We know the schools around us. And he was just he was just a cool dude. So that's what attracted me to him in the beginning was just seeing him. I, I could put, you know, faces with him when I got there. And then I started seeing him on uh, campus and in the summer working hard and everything. So when did you first start playing? So did you redshirt your freshman year, or did you immediately get out there on the field and start playing? No, I redshirted my freshman year, and then my freshman year, I played. I started at left tackle. I was an undersized tackle. Okay. So I came in as a center, but I had to play left tackle as an undersized tackle. Okay. So what was that uh, transition like? Like, was it really hard? Because that's the money maker uh, right there, man, right hand quarterback, was, left uh, hand, uh, left side tackle. You know what? It's crazy because the I didn't know I was gonna play left tackle until the day before the game. Yeah. So I was supposed to be playing center, and it was a guy named Joyce Sylvie, and the other guy was South Pierre Florida. Pierre Paul. Jason. Hey, let me cut in real quick. So George Sylvie was a first round projection. 
Pierre Paul was coming out of Juco, I believe. Nobody knew about Nobody him. knew who he was until after that game. And for all y'all football fans, y'all know who Pierre Paul is. But we didn't know when we first played South well, Florida. Yes, we, well, the thing is, we did know. Yeah. We knew. My coach, he knew that the other guy was better. Okay, so then. So that's why he moved me over to okay, the tackle to match against him. Because he, 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 just, he saw him. He had already knew from watching the film. Exactly. So I had to go against Joey. I'm mean, not Sylvie, but uh, Pierre Paul. Paul. Oh man, what was that like? That was like uh, <clears throat> it's crazy, man. I remember like the second play, he clubbed me. I blinked and I gave up a sack. Yeah. All right. Well, he started coaching me. He was like, hey, he was like, hey, has, what you do? You get your hands there, and he wasn't doing it out of like making fun. He was really like trying to help me, you know. He was like, "Man, I know you don't play left tackle. I can see you haven't even doing your right kick shot, you know." So I, I want to ask you, how did that make you feel, bro? Like somebody on the other team mm -hmm. whooping you mm -hmm. and coaching you all at the same time. Like, hey. has, was that the first and last time that happened? Definitely the first and last. Time. Okay, well, you how know. did that make you feel? Like somebody coaching you during so the game? What I had to do was, I remember going back to the sideline saying, "Hey, coach, I can't use technique. Let me just block this guy." Yeah. He's like, "Well, do it." Like, duh. You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> well, why, why, why are you saying that? So once I went back, squared up, like, "Hey, look, forget kicked up. Just get this guy blocked," and um, you know, the rest was history. Yeah, that that's one of those things that makes a guy elite is the ability to adjust in game. Like we learn technique, 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 but the craziest thing about it is people really don't realize is I'm a receiver, he's a DB. He's learning technique to beat me and stop me and I'm learning technique, so it's technique on technique, but at some point you just gotta stop somebody or beat somebody, right? Make a play. And I think that was what Floyd Mayweather always talks about. And as the reason why nobody was as good as him because nobody could adjust in the ring like he could. I'm gonna calculate and figure out what you're doing, and once I figure it out, it's over for you from there. And a lot of people have had maybe more speed in their hands, been bigger punches and this and that, but the thing they never had was the adjustment mm -hmm. that he was able to do. So that's cool to speak on because you're like, you know what, I just got to adjust and stop this guy. Forget all this technique for this. We'll go back and do that during practice. Yeah, exactly. But I got to stop this man yeah. today you know, in real time. I, and I think it's important that you, you learn how to adjust as well because – I never played left tackle. I was yeah. there before, you know, the day before, they're like, hey, you're going to play left tackle. This guy is, we need you on this guy. You know, you yeah. got to be adaptable. That's what makes you an athlete. You know, yeah. you have to adjust. Exactly. So let's talk about, so we talked about some of the dog in what you had, T-Pat. Mm -hmm. And I told you that we're going to go into the, the dog, but how it led you to be great and fight through tough times. But we also know. Like I said, before we started, I told you I was going to bring it up, but the kids also need to know how to, how can being a dog also hinder you, right? Yeah. I always got on you at KU about, like, bro, you got to chill. Like, you can't run around wanting to fight everybody. I remember the first time you were out there, um, one of our receivers, you stopped him. You did everything you needed to do. And you're a freshman, right, true freshman. You made a pass breakup. He gets mad, throws the ball at you, pushes you or whatever, and you immediately swing back two a days, right? Mm -hmm. Coach Mangino is going off on you. He's going off on the DV coach. So, like you said, you have a fast trigger. And that was multiple times from freshman year through your time at KU. Like, so what do you think would trigger you so fast? And, like, and like, what would you have done different? Would you just say, hey, I'm a dog, and if you want to fight, you want to fight? Or do, do you think you could have handled some things differently when you first got there and throughout yeah. your time? Uh, I mean, you definitely have to handle certain things in a certain situation, right? Uh, that case – in that situation, yeah. that didn't bother me that much. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. If God pushes me, I push him back. That's part yeah. of that's part of practicing, part of football. But uh, especially doing two days. Yeah, bro, we are gonna fight. That's just part of it. That's just part of the game. People mad, tired, frustrated. Mm -hmm. um, but it's other situations, man, that I I know I could have handled different. Um, like you said, it's just that trigger in me. It's something that I've been dealing with my whole life of trying to. Still had that fiery passion, but have it under control. Exactly. You know what I mean? And being able to control when it comes out and when it doesn't. Um, you know, but there's there's certain situations, bro, that it that it hindered me because, you know, I'm I'm so competitive and I, I wanna win so bad. And when somebody doesn't know that, especially a coach, mm -hmm. if they don't know who you truly are as a person, 
it comes off wrong. Yep. 100%. You know what I'm saying? No matter what you say after or before, it's going to come off wrong. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? If a coach, if I, if I mess up on a play, 100% already, I'm the type of player, when I mess up on a play, I already know what I messed up on. Yeah. So I'm already pissed about it. So when a coach comes to me and say something to me, I'm like, man, coach, I know, man. I know. I got it. He going to take that wrong. Like, you know, you're not trying to listen to me, but I'm like, no, nah, I already know what I messed up on. Exactly. But there's certain times where you got to be like, yes, sir. You know what I mean? You got to take in what everybody's saying. Um, and that's one of the areas that I wish I would have held back a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, at certain times, even at KU, I got labeled as uncoachable yeah. just for that specific reason. I was coachable, but I liked it. I already knew what I needed to be coached Like I said, on. I was so coachable that um, – I knew what I was doing wrong, right? So you right. were coachable because you knew what you were doing wrong. So it's like you don't got to coach me up on this again because I know what I did yeah. wrong. Some guys literally have no idea, no idea. what they did wrong. Right. So that's just a, a big thing that some guys, you know, get. It's like, bro, don't keep telling me. Like, I know I got to yeah. fix it. And for you to say, turn your foot. I know I'm trying to do yeah. it. Like, but, like, and I understand where you're going with that. So with that being said, do you feel like, so you, they labeled you as uncoachable and this and that. So did it just follow you, like, throughout your whole time at KU? Did it ever change? Did they ever feel like, okay, he's getting better or he's just just this guy? Um, I think some coaches grew to know me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, at KU, we went through so many coaches exactly. that it can change. But um, there was definitely a few guys, um, Coach Vic Sheely, uh, like a guy like that who he knew who I was, right? Mm-hmm. Um, he knew what type of player I was. He knew how much I cared about the game. Um, and that's something I talked to him about to this day. He said, man, you were hard to coach, but I loved coaching you because I knew, I knew you how cared. much you cared about it, how passionate you were about the game. And he said, that's something that every player doesn't have. You know what I mean? So, like, it has its good and balanced. But sometimes, man, you just got to be humble. You know what I mean? Say yes, sir, no, sir. Play the game with the coaches. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Even if you don't agree. Say, yes, sir. No, sir. Okay, I got you, coach. You know what I mean? Even in your head, you're like, man, it's. Man, he don't know what he's talking about. Got you, coach. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's about playing that game, bro. You know what I mean? It's, you know, I mean, that, that correlates to life. You can't just go around in life speaking everything you want to speak. You know what I mean? Yeah. Acting a certain way. So you got to listen sometimes. Sometimes you just got to suck it up, put that pride to the side, and, and move on. So I talk to people about that all the time when I was like, if you have a real, real, real <laughs> want to go to the NFL, mm-hmm and extend your career beyond college. Even you beyond ha- high school. Yeah, or beyond yeah, high school. You have to learn how to play the game with the coaches because there's probably not a sport that I think that it's more ego-driven mm-hmm. by the coaches. Basketball, it's, it's not like that, right? There's mm-hmm. not – you got a big man coach and maybe – but it's just not like everybody's a p- position coach and all these assistant coaches. Right. These strength coaches, I feel like you have to shut up sometimes if that's because at the end of your time, your coach is going to say he's uncoachable, he didn't do this, no matter how many interceptions you made, right? Um, And that's the craziest thing. If you want to make it to that league, if you want to make it to college, sometimes you just got to shut up because your coach can really play a big factor in, you know, deterring your your dream to go there. So, Hatch, I know when I was there with you, you were always more laid back. I didn't see you get into it with too many guys on the defense, too many coaches. Like, what kind of gave you that laid back personality, especially coming from Dallas Carter, right? That ain't the easiest school to go to. Like, I'm quite sure, you know, there was a plenty of dogs out there and a lot of back and forth, and you had to be a guy out there. Like, nah, bro, like, if something's going this way, I ain't going to let you just punk me. But I feel like when you came up there, like, nobody was punking you, but there wasn't, like, just – you weren't walking around with a big chip on your shoulder every day to out to prove, like, you know, I'm more masculine than you. Well, I think just coming from a place with a lot of competition yeah, uh, from where I came from, you know, you don't, you don't really make a big deal out of competition mm-hmm. you know, once it's in front of you, you know. Once you're done with the field of play, then you talk. You know, then, you know, you get back and you talk a little trash. But while you're playing, you know, you don't have to walk around and, and boast like that. And plus, in the trenches, you know if you lost or won. You mm-hmm. don't have to say nothing, you know. Exactly. <laughs> Either you're going to get a sack or you're going to get put on your back. So it's, it, it was simple as that. But other than that, that's kind of how I treated it, you know. Yeah, no, definitely. So we'll talk about 
moving on. T-Pat moved on from KU to Oklahoma State. So we talked about being labeled as uncoachable, right? Didn't want to listen to anybody. So Charlie Weiss comes in. You started, what, 36 straight games at KU? Something like that. 36 straight games at KU, making plays, and all of a sudden you get a text, phone call, whatever, and yeah. you're off the team. Right. You got to transfer. Like, no real reason. Didn't do nothing in school. Didn't do nothing off the field. You're an uncoachable guy. Like, how did, how did that feel? I started 36 straight games at this school, and out of all the guys you let go, you let me go. Right. Like, how did that, like, how did that feel? Um, you know, it felt, it felt wrong at the time, you know what I mean, just to, just to receive a text message and to tell a kid that you're, you know, you're no longer on the team. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I was big on that family atmosphere at KU. So that was the big thing for me that I was going to have to leave my brothers. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And, um, you know, I understood it. I understood the type of coach he was. This mm -hmm. is something that he had already done in the offseason, mm -hmm. letting guys go. So this was nothing – New to him. Exactly. Right? And he had told us, hey, I'm going to let some guys go after the season. Let, like 28, 30 guys go. Yeah. So when, when the test came, I was shocked, of course, because like you said, I know what type of player I am. You know, I mm -hmm. went through some injuries, um, hadn't had the like the most consistent years, but I was still making good ball and plays. At the end of the day, I still started 36 you know straight. Like, so, I did enough to be out there. Yeah. It was, it was, it was bad in that sense, but in, in that moment, I was able to see the good out of it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like you said, I knew what type of player I was. So I'm yeah. like, man, if I'm if I'm a transfer, I'm gonna be able to go somewhere where I'm gonna be able to make some plays yeah. and have a better chance of making it to the NFL. Because yeah. that was my end goal, mm -hmm. you know, from the jump anyway. So, you know, it was bad in that sense that I had to leave everybody. But at the time it was a it was a great new opportunity for me, man, that I really look forward to. So Definitely, definitely. Hatch, I know you went all five years at KU. You, once you started your red shirt sophomore year, I mean freshman year, you started all four years, correct? Correct. And only games that you didn't start were games you didn't play in due to injury. Correct. Right? So I know you went through injuries what, with your back. Correct. Did you have any more? I remember your back was the real big one. Yeah, just a major back uh, issue. So uh, those were the only games that I missed. I did miss one game due to plantar fasciitis. Okay, right yeah. Yeah, so – that was pretty much it. Other than that, I started. So with that, uh, I asked you that because I know a lot of guys uh, do go through injuries, and some guys don't play because, like I said, they're just a little banged up. You had some major, like, injuries. What kind of pushed you to keep playing? Was it playing for your boys? Was it, like, I'm tough enough to do that? Was the coaches? Was the training staff? Because we all have, you know, reasons of why we played through an injury. Like, what was keeping you going through all those tough injuries? I mean, I think it's just the love of the game. You know, you, you – I mean, you dream as a kid to go play at Texas Stadium. And, mm -hmm. you know, like, whatever you got to do to get back out there, you're going to do it. So, you know, I think it's just the passion for the game what kept me going. Yeah. No, that was definitely – I remember just seeing you playing and the toughness. Like, man, Hatch's back is messed up up and he's still out here being a dog like yeah. what what's making him do that because I understand being a wide receiver playing through certain injuries right but every down like me and T-Pat might not get contacted for a whole half depending on if I'm getting the ball if the ball's thrown towards him and he gotta make plays you don't get to run around contact so that was just something that really Really, you know, we looked at it as like this is a lineman playing through that. There's a difference of playing through injury at a skill and a lineman. Like, did do you feel like because we talk about it a lot, a lot of uh, uh, effects after the time is over. Did you do you still have any of those effects on your back or injuries? Like, uh, do you feel do you I feel think, them? Uh, yeah, of course. I feel all my hands, like all my fingers have been broken, and so. Yeah. Especially in my hands and my limbs, like my feet. You got 350-pound guys stepping on your feet mm -hmm. every play. So I feel a lot in my limbs, my lower limbs and upper limbs. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think it, it makes you better, though, yeah. you know, mentally. You yeah. know, to, to physically get beat like that and still be able to come back and do it. It makes life a lot easier. Yeah. Now I feel like I can do anything you know, yeah. as far as playing on injuries and things like that. You know, waking up at 5 a.m. or doing a real estate deal or something like that, it's, it's easy. Now, easy. You know? Cool, cool. Well, we're going to almost transition out, but we did have 
some things for so T Pat, you went to Oklahoma State, you played there. We'll fast forward through that. You did start um once you got out there, you worked your way into the starting lineup, had a good career out there and was afforded opportunities to play in the NFL with multiple teams. What was it like, first of all, being undrafted, having to be a dog again and work your way over? So you had to work your way and be in who you were at KU. You had to work your way into being who you were at Oklahoma State. You had to work your way to doing what you did on the Cowboys, the Dolphins, all these different teams, the Jags that you played on. So what was it like on your journey, like being what, as you called it, like a, a tryout player in the NFL, which is like every year is a tryout to make the team. You got guys like OBJ, they're not trying out. They're on the team every year until they pretty much retire. Right. For you, every year you went out there, it's like, oh, can I make this team? What What's that journey like? Um, Man, it just goes back to that, like we talked about that dog mentality mm -hmm. that I had. That's part of the gift. You know what I mean? I always looked at myself as an underdog. I was never the fastest. I was never the strongest. I always had the best feet. I about to say, he you has the quickest saying? feet and hips, and yeah. I'm willing to say that I trained a <laughs> lot of guys. He has the feet, quickest feet and now. hips. Come on now. <laughs> say something if you want to. You can't, you can't, you can't swing a golf course. <laughs> no, but uh, uh, that was just part of that gift, man, that – you know, I always had to fight for everything I had. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And when it came to the NFL, it was just the same thing for me. You know what I mean? Coming out, I feel like I should have got drafted out of Oklahoma State. I didn't. Okay, let me go prove it. Three-day tryout with the Cowboys. You know what I mean? I had to beat out people they drafted. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? And I made the team off that. I had to do it every single year that I was in the league, bro. Mm -hmm. That's just part of the, like I said, part of the gift I had of my attitude, my mentality. Nobody could stop me. Nothing was going to stop me. I was going to keep pushing through no matter what. You know what I mean? And it was tough, but, you know, I made a great great career out of it, five years of it. God blessed me with it. So, What was uh, what was the favorite, most favorite team you played on? Well, I know you played, like I said, Cowboys, Jags. I know you were out in, with the Dolphins a little bit and bounced around. What, what was your favorite team to be on? Uh, my favorite team as a whole, like as a team, was probably um, – 2017 with the Jags. Okay. Um, lot that looked fun guys. with Bouye, Ramsey, young yeah. guys really doing their thing in right. the secondary. And I really too. wasn't even playing that much. Yeah. But I had fun. You know what I mean? Just being around that competition. You know what I mean? Just being around all those guys. I mean, we had like, I want to say, eight of our starters on defense had been to the Pro Bowl. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So just to be around those guys and have that atmosphere. Again, it, it goes back to that family atmosphere. You know what I mean? We was a lot of guys that were close and, um, you know, a lot of guys that just worked. You know what I mean? So to have that, man, it was fun, bro, just to go on that run, you know, went to the AFC Championship. And Which you could have probably won that game, right? It was a, won yeah, about to say, a tight yeah. game with the Patriots. Lost it in the fourth quarter, break yeah. in the fourth. And, um, you know, just to experience that, be a part of that, man, um, that team as a whole was one of my favorite teams just to be on. You know, and as an organization, I mean, when you play with the Cowboys, it doesn't, it, it don't get no better than the Cowboys. It's just that it's organization. Team. You know what I mean? They they know how to do things. They know how to order things. Uh, media report things, man. It's just a certain structure that they have. Um, and I didn't really see and respect that until I left and went to other teams. And seeing what you didn't have. You I remember that's that kind of like when I was on uh, – my peewee team we were like the gold standard peewee yeah. well you don't know that until you went when, when i my last year of peewee we broke up and i went to a different team pep rallies was starting an hour and a yeah. half late yeah. equipment was late you know yeah. what i mean yeah. you don't understand those things and i the reason why i say that is you said that i said that but it ain't just sports where we talk about with business and personal life a lot of people miss out on things that are so great right in front of them because it's always been right there and then boom it's gone and you like yeah, I left something that I had a lot better time doing yeah. for something that looked cool at the time. All right, yeah, the grass ain't always greener. Exactly. Like say, man, you just learn to appreciate everything that's in front of you, bro. And just like we had like training camp, we go three days in a row, full pads, get a day off, mm -hmm. and we kept doing that cycle the whole training camp. I'm thinking like, we all thinking like, bro, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. This is tough. <laughs> Went to Jacksonville. We having five days in a row, full <laughs> pads, bro. We going crazy. Hurting. So, I mean, you see, I mean, like I said, you see the good and the bad, but a lot of times, like you said, it's hard to see it when it's right in your face. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need to step back, get that bird eyes view and see exactly. how good you really got it. So. so, Hatch, what about you? So, obviously, you played at KU that we've mentioned, and 
Did you ever try to pursue the NFL? Did you do pre pro day? Were you trying to go to the league after? What was kind of your journey after as far as athletics went after you graduated from KU? Mm, I think um, I did pursue the NFL, but I always tell Pat this all the time. I don't think I worked hard enough mm -hmm. to make it to the NFL. I mean, look, look, can you look into this camera? That's the one Judah told us. Oh, okay. Look in there and, and tell the, these kids, look, you saw that in yourself. You didn't do what? I didn't work hard enough for the NFL. Exactly, and that's what a lot of people don't see. They think they don't make it because some coach didn't like them. There's times that happens. Yeah. But sometimes you got to look, and that's what I respect about a lot of guys that I went to school with. Um, we played at KU when it was sorry, when it was good and all that. But a lot of the guys will really sit back and tell you, I did this or I didn't do that. Yeah. T-Pat told you he should have changed some of the things in his attitude. Mm -hmm. Hatch just sat there and said, I did not work hard enough for the NFL. So I'm going to let you keep going, but I'm glad that you said that, and I'm glad that T-Pat also said it too. Like Accountability is big that a lot of people won't do. Yeah. Everything's everybody else's problem and fault why you didn't get to where you wanted to go. Just to touch on that real quick, it's, uh -huh. it's big because in order to grow as a player or even grow as a man, an individual, a human, you have to look at yourself and see where your faults are. Your faults are. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? You can't just sit back and say, oh, I'm good. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I'm good. I'm, I'm fast enough. I'm big enough. I'm smart enough. My relationships are good enough. No, you got to work. Just like you work in football, you got to work at every aspect of your life. Exactly. You know what I mean? And that's just a big part of it, bro. It's just admitting. Like, I had a hard time at that first. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It took We've me. had many talks out there when it was just me and you training yeah. out of Hebrew. And like, hey, Pat, like, I'm outside looking in. And, you know, this is coming from a place right. of love. Like, I seen you as a young pup, and I'm seeing you in the league. Like, it's just, I know you, so it's not fair for me to tell somebody that doesn't know you. Like, I can't convince them because they haven't been around you long enough. I said, I know you care. I know your work. We were at the hills at 9 o'clock at night by ourselves, but you have to change your demeanor because right. other people don't think you care. So regardless, if you know you do, you still have to change as a man to let other people know. Not, not your morals and right. integrity, but you got to look at yourself. What am I doing that everybody feels this way about me? Yeah, it's just that image, bro. It's what you put out there. You know what I'm saying? It, it took me a long, it took me to about the last couple of years in my league to really realize it and mm -hmm. admit that about myself. Like you said, a lot of times I was blaming other people. You know what I mean? But then I realized, hey, some of this is my fault, too. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And you just got to sit back and admit that, bro. And like you said, take that step back and look at yourself. You know what I mean? So that's a that's a big part of it, bro. It took me over, you know what I'm saying, 22 years to realize that. Yeah. And that's, that's a big thing about, like, why we get back, why I want to coach, why we want to mentor these kids is because we want to help you guys, like, avoid the mistakes that we did. Mm-hmm. And if you listen, you can do that. And, and you know what I'm saying? It was the same thing with our parents. If we would have mm -hmm. listened a little bit more what they said, it would have been the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's just that cycle. You know exactly. what I'm saying? As a kid, we don't think they know what they're talking about, but they do. They do. You know what I mean? So when it's guys like DP, you know what I mean, training you, I mean, it's, it's a huge deal, man. He knows what he's talking about. He's experienced it, and he's been around hundreds of people that have been through it. So Exactly. So I, I appreciate that. Like with that being said, I know we ran off a little bit, but that's what this is about. If we got a point, we really want to expand on it for, for these youngsters or not even the youngsters, the cats that are in the league that might be older than us that say, hey, man, you're on year five and you can make it to 12 if you look at yourself and change it before it's too late. So as you said, you did, didn't work hard enough to get there, but what were your, so your next steps? I, I didn't work hard enough. You did pro day? Yeah, I did pro okay. day. Uh, didn't do good because I didn't work hard enough. For, yeah, you know, um, I think I think that transition was a rough time in my life, man. Yeah, it was it was real rough. You know, I, you think you old, you seen other people in the NFL, mm -hmm. you know, especially your boys yeah. too that you started with or played in front of, and like they made it. And you're not mad, but you it's, no, you're comparing. Yeah, like yeah. I played with these guys, so. You know, yeah. I know that's hard. So it, it, it was real hard um, looking at that and sharing that, especially seeing guys that you beat in college, you physically <laughs> beat in college. And you're like, well, how's this guy in the NFL? You know, so that was mm -hmm. a real hard transition. But, you know, just being a, an athlete, having a great mind, uh, a fighting attitude, like, hey, look, that's not the end. Yeah. You know, now I know I have to work hard. Mm -hmm. Now – I just have to transition into another ministry of my life. Exactly. You know? So now it's not football. Now it's something that 
I can share a passion with it and help somebody change their life, you know. So it's 100%. it's just it's just about understanding your mistakes and, mm-hmm. and going forward. No, so I'm glad you said that because we're going to transition now into our change of direction of how we were athletes and now how are we in the real world. So Hatch and T-Pat are into real estate. They both mentor. They both help out in the community. Um, Hatch has been owning what Hatch Homes mm-hmm. for four years now. Uh-huh. So T-Pat that's- doesn't have, say, a business or a company per se. Um, Maybe that's in the future, maybe not. You don't have to to be in the real estate, right? But he's in the real estate. He just bought his first piece of land not too long ago and is working on that. So let's talk about what's up, start with you, Hatch. What got you into, you know, wanting to get into real estate and starting your own business? What, what kind of got you into that? Well, the first initial thought is, you know, when people see real estate, they think the luxury life. Mm-hmm. Um, so I basically was trying to chase a life that I thought that I could get from athlete through real estate. Um, ended up not being have it would not work you know mm-hmm. I had to work hard I ubered for mm-hmm. capital um, I worked in the oil field for capital you know I was like man what are, what are you doing trying to chase a life but then I realized the impact that real estate has on the world you know yeah. um, it affects our schools you know um, you know good parents take care of good schools, you know, the parents, PTAs, things like that. It also uh, affects sports in every which way, you know. Uh, In Dallas, kids don't even have opportunities like this, you know. And Mm -hmm. me coming up in Oak Cliff and Carter, we didn't have a workout facility like this. You just had to get it. When I got to college, I was like, wait, what is this? Oh, yeah. This mm-hmm. is what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be doing this five to seven times a week, you mm-hmm. know. So it's just things like that. Real estate effect, affects that. You yeah. Know? When you don't have that, then you have to go out further, you know, to Arlington or DeSoto. Now that's why you see a lot of these DeSoto kids. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why DeSoto is good. They have all the inner city kids, but they don't have the facility, the yeah. resources, the things like that. So exactly. that's kind of how I got into um my passion for real estate. Okay. You know, cool. understanding how it affects people and changes people's lives. Okay. What about you, uh, Pat? So you bought your first uh, piece of real estate. Mm-hmm. Did you think about buying real estate when you were in the league? Did it come after? Was it, you know, hey, my career's winding down. I better find something to get some yeah. money. Like, what kind of got you into that? Um, this is something I had I had been thinking about, right? Mm-hmm. But when you're an athlete, you know what I mean, a football player, a professional football player, sometimes that's all you think about, right? Mm-hmm. So that's all I was focused on. And a big thing about what made me get into real estate is this guy right here. Okay. You know what I mean? He's a guy that really broke it down to me, explained it to me, walked me through the process, put me in meeting rooms with people that could explain stuff to me, taught me everything I needed to know. Okay. And that was a big deal for me, man, because it's like, you know what I mean? Like Hash said, we hard workers. That's what we do. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But – when you transition to another field, another career, you gotta you gotta go back down to being mm-hmm. a baby. You know what I'm saying? I don't know nothing about real estate like that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I had to humble myself, put myself back at the bottom of the totem pole. You know what I'm saying? And, and was willing enough to learn from people around me to get okay. truly into real estate. You know what I mean? So um, I got into it, man, and, and just being around this guy and he, like you said, he teaches stuff about the community. Um, and just the just, just the things it can do for your family and even the people around around mm-hmm. in the community, it can change people's lives, right? And it can set up my kids, their kids, and generations after that. And you know, we can just start to re- reverse that cycle, man. So, so you know, and I like to touch, you know, because this this kind of like my son, oh, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. I, um, when he said it can change people's lives, it really can change people's lives. You know, sometimes mm-hmm. we make, me and Tyler was talking about this earlier, sometimes we make decisions based off of having to make money to mm-hmm. feed our families. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, um, we get in a situation where, hey, we buy three pieces of property and it's earning us income. Now I don't have to go be a teacher if I don't want to be a teacher, right. you know. Mm-hmm. Now I can go out and serve the community and be in church every day. This guy goes to church every, you know, every day. He's exactly. able to do the things that he wants to do without sacrificing his morals or his conscience for a piece of paper. 
You know? Exactly. So it, it changes life. You, we got another guy. You see, his his mother works there. His father works there. I mean, we actually, you can always say his name. We're going to have him on the you show know, as well. Th- yeah, things like yeah, that. Yeah. Like, they, it really changes your life. That, you know, exactly. So real estate is really big in changing people's lives. And that's, uh, and I'm, I'm assuming you're referring to uh, Devante? Correct. With, uh, uh, Harris House of Heroes. We're going to have him on the show as well. But yeah, like you said, with him getting into that building and this and that, uh, he's killing it. They're going out there and changing, you know, what McKinney Ave and Uptown look like, you know, bringing more black folks out there. Mm-hmm. We're bring, trying to bring more black folks into real estate because we know that's where a lot of the millionaires and multimillionaires and billionaires are at. And I think that's what we need to do more is get into real estate so we can pass down the land, these buildings, these businesses, you know, to our family. Um, with that being said, I know you said Hatch helped you get in. And I know when talking with you, Jay Morris, I follow him as well. So hopefully one day we can get him on. I know his story as well. So that was a big inspiration for you, right? You say you were just scrolling down Instagram and you yeah, and you just, seen it? I just happened to be scrolling down Instagram and I seen Jay and I started – I just started watching his YouTube. He was one of the first guys that I saw doing, like, YouTube videos Mm -hmm. about real estate, teaching me about credit. And, you know, I just – I fell in love, man. I was like, if he can do it – and he was a – you know, he was an ex – Drug dealer. With some, yeah, he was talking about all type of he crazy stuff he was about doing. All crazy, all kind of stuff, and then he was also working for top companies. Mm-hmm. You know, he was the CEO of top company. He's ran what fifteen major companies, the first black trust fund uh, for real estate funds. Like mm-hmm. he's doing amazing work because of his, you know, his attitude, his mind, and his passion for the real estate world. Yes, definitely. So I'll talk to. Um UT Pat, what was it like getting that first piece of real estate mm-hmm. under your belt? Like, was it a hard search? Was did it pop up on you? Like, there's different ways. Sometimes you gotta search through the mud. Sometimes it's like, hey, you heard about this building? That's how I got this one. So it literally popped up in my hands. Not yeah. everything is you gotta get out the mud. What was that like? And what was the feeling after you know locking that deal in? Um, the way it came about is kind of it's, it's kind of crazy. It just kind of touches back on my faith and my background. Uh, my faith in God, but um, we were looking, for, Hatch was helping me look for property, mm-hmm. right? And we came across a, a deal in uh, Bishop Arts. It was a, it was going to be a flip okay. a house, right? And um, we went to the house, we looked at it, we liked the deal. We said, hey, we want to we wanna make an offer, right? So the guy said, okay, hey, you got to put down this much. We want to go write the check. Uh, before we write, before we hand the guy the check, the check, Hatch says, hey, man, let's go say a prayer real quick. We go say a prayer, right? We come back, hand the guy the check, and he said, hey, man, for some reason my computer's not working. I can't put the check in. Uh, just bring it to my office later. Hatch's like, all right, we'll take the check. We'll leave. As um, soon as we leave, man, we get in the car, say about five minutes later, another guy that we met, his name is Kevin, real big guy, real big guy in the community, a great man, great company, Simply Customs, and uh, he called and said, hey, I got this property for you. You know, I got this lot for you that you can buy, you know, cheap price, mm-hmm. great opportunity. And it opened up like that. I mean, it was just, just one of those things, man, where, you know, patience and prayer, bro, we was able to, to obtain that, that lot. And then a couple months later, the one next to it opened up. Okay. So he's got two great opportunities, great lots for land, and right next to each other. It doesn't happen like that. He'll tell you, he's been a real estate game for for a long time. One hat, this man is blessed. (laughs) Blessed. And it's multi-family. So you can get more than one door on each lot. Yeah. So now he's talking about, you know, apartments and, you know, things like that. So now he's talking about a whole different scale that we were just going to do a flip. We were just going to get a hundred thousand dollars, you know, back in his pocket. But now we, you know, now we're talking about big stuff. Right. That's big, and like you said, y'all went and did a prayer. You said he's blessed. So we'll we'll come back to some of the business stuff, but let's talk about that since we're talking to you, T-Pat, about, like, your your faith. Like, I know it's grown so much since leaving KU, Oklahoma State, leave to where you're at right now. Like, yeah. so what was kind of that transition for you to get to kind of where you're at with your faith and religion and all that? Um, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about, just looking at yourself. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, you know, my attitude was such a problem, man. I had to figure out what was really going on with me. You know what I mean? I had to really sit back and, and try to understand why I was wired the way I was wired. Mm-hmm. And um, 
you know, always had a, a longing for something, but I couldn't figure out what it was. And, um, you know, we look to, you know, as just people in our culture, man, we look to the wrong things to fulfill mm -hmm. us. You know, we might look at football to fulfill us. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We get them accomplished. I made it to the NFL. I still wasn't feeling happy. Felt the same as you know I did before. I had money, money, right? You know what I'm saying? I, I could go talk to any girl I wanted to. You know what I'm saying? And I still wasn't feeling right. You know what I mean? And it wasn't until I got into that word, man, I dove into that word, that I started to realize who I was uh, and realized that I needed to rebuild my foundation. Yeah. You know what I mean? And uh, started off at my, my church at One Community um, in Plano, man, and, and the pastor there just challenged me so well. You know what I mean? I We went there. And I felt like every Sunday I went there, he was talking directly to me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And and he was challenging me. You know what I mean? He wasn't okay with, okay, you uh, you only have sex every now and then with your girlfriend, or you only lie every now. And then. No, you're not supposed to do it. Don't Point do it at period. all. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's what helped me build that foundation, bro. And then, you know, it was just something that, you know, took my mindset to another level. You know what I mean? A lot of people think when they get to the NFL. Uh, when they get to the NBA, MLB, whatever they do, they're going to have so, so much peace, right? Yeah. But it wasn't until I left the NFL, I got into, I was able to attend church all the time, be in the Word all the time, that now, bro, people would think I'm wrecked because I'm not in the NFL no more. No, I'm at more peace than I've ever been in my life just because of that Word. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I think people have so many assumptions about it um, that they don't dive into it. And it's when you dive into it, bro, and really do the research and really study. I think it's that's what you said, the research and the study. People don't research and study about right. the religion, uh, their faith. Mm -hmm. And that's not me saying, oh, no, I'm talking about anything, though. Like, people just go off of what everybody exactly. else tells them. Like, research and study it and see if it's for you. Exactly. And that's the big thing. You said until you research and study, that's when it really clip for yeah me. man because I'm like you said people make assumptions about the church all the time mm -hmm. are they judgmental though I sinned I can't no bro if you really look into this word you know what I'm saying being a Christian being a, a believer man it's all about love right Understood. I gotta love you no matter what you slap me in my face right now I gotta say I forgive you and I'm still gonna block that <laughs> left thing out of TV. Yeah, right, no, no. <laughs> but no, man, it took a lot of. It, that's one of the things that helped me take a big look in the mirror, bro. Yeah. And kind of really break down who I was that's real. and what I needed to change about myself and how to do it. That's you know what I mean? It's, it's, I'm still changing. It's yeah. still a lot of work. I was at LA. Ever, ever. You know what I'm saying? I was at LA Fitness the other day getting into people playing <laughs> basketball. You know, it's just part of me. Yeah, you know what I'm mean, saying? Man. Look, <laughs> you know, it's like. That's what I tell kids, man. It's like something in our culture we've been taught for 20 plus years. Yeah. You're supposed to have the most girls, mm -hmm. right? You're supposed to be this big superstar, have the most money, pop the most bottles in the car. Cars, you know what jewelry. I'm saying? You know what I mean? So it's our culture, bro, that we look to those things, you know what I mean? And it takes a long time to reverse that cycle. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? If I, if I ask you today, hey, um, stop brushing your teeth in the morning. How hard is that going to be? I've been doing it, it for help. It's programmed. You know what I'm saying? So you just gonna, you just get up in the morning and do it. Mm -hmm. It's programmed in the soul. It's a lot of things that are programmed in us from our culture um, and just from the beliefs that we have in this world, man. And it's it's hard. It's hard. It's hard being a believer. Because mm -hmm. like I say, you just got to reverse. You got to put the work in. It, it's just like everything else. You be a great football player, you put the work in. You want to be a good believer, you got to put that work in. So real for real no that that's a cool journey I, and i've seen it and, and it's cool to see like just in our group chat the way that replies come back and this and that you be like just t pat hold on who got t pat falling like but it's cool to see like as yeah. your brothers because i feel like as ku our group is like one of the most tight-knit with that amount of guys people are spread out all across the world in different coaching to real estate to training to whatever medical sales and we're still so tight. Like every game, every year, we're trying to get back all to the spring game or set up something. So that's really cool to see. And, and it's cool just to see that evolution of all of our guys doing really good. So I'm going to bounce it back over to you, Hatch. T Pat talked about religion was a big, you know, and his faith was a big change for him in his mindset. You talked about you weren't a hard worker in college to get to where you wanted to go to the league. But now you're doing really good in real estate. What helped you change that mindset outside of just noticing. Like you can notice all the time, like, oh, I'm fat, oh, I'm slow, I'm, I'm this, I'm that. 
whatever, you can notice, you know, that I can't read good. What was the things that you did after noticing um, that? And, and, don't, and don't think because my first example was out bad. I looked at myself. <laughs> I, looked at myself. <laughs> I looked at myself. But no, but no. I still get rid of the folks. Chill out. Chill out. Folks, self. Keep that. Keep that. Keep that. What were those things that you really implemented after noticing, like, hey, I wasn't a hard worker in this. I need to do these things to help me move forward to become a hard worker and succeed at this walk of life. Well, I think um, I thank God that I noticed that I didn't work hard. Yeah, that it's that simple thing knowing that you didn't work hard and seeing guys like T. Pat, seeing guys like you, you know, you coming in, opening up a business on. Instagram with uh, what's Alabama coach? Uh, Nick Saban. I know that's a saying not to know his name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, Nick Saban. You, you know, he's doing business. Yeah, you know, you, you're doing you doing things like that. Seeing my peers around me, like, oh, you know, you don't have to have football to be to be great. You know, mm -hmm. most of these people who living and owning seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollar homes, they don't play football. You're the only idiot that's playing football for you know eight hundred thousand dollars. What was that? Uh, Chris Rock. That was like. Uh, yeah, when I pull up in my neighborhood, I got I'm like the best comedian in the world. I'm like, hey, what do you do? I'm a doctor. Like, yeah. oh, I'm a lawyer. Like, they're just regular people. But I'm like this most well known person, and I live next door to the person. Like, oh yeah, I'm just I'm a doctor. Like, and that was one of the big things I wanted to do, and that you're doing, and that T Pat is starting to grow to do a show. Like, you don't need the league to make league money or more. Yeah. Way more, right? The people that are making the most with, aren't the players; with, it's the owners. With less, with less effort, you know. As, as far as stress, and, you know, body, body and longevity. Like longevity. the league you money is only for got, that three to five, yeah. ten. Even if you have a Tom Brady, Brady career, twenty years, Kobe Bryant, LeBron, seventeen, all these years, you're still forty years nice. old when you're done, yeah. and you're missing so much time of your children's. Your children's life at that those things. You know, I can, I can say, hey, I'm finna go eat lunch with my wife. Mm -hmm. I can say, hey, Pat, let's go to the golf course. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can you can do things that you know we talked about earlier. You know, when him making a big decision, he doesn't have to base that decision off of a dollar. Mm -hmm. Now he has his income working for him. Now, like I said, he can go to one community and and, and pass them there as mm -hmm. far as to the children. So you can do things like that. it opens up more options. Yeah. yeah, so we'll talk about, let's talk about the, the football camp. Okay. So y'all did the football camp out of, um, we know we were about to do it at SMU, some things uh, didn't go right there. Um, what, where were we at when we did the camp? Where did we end up having it? Arlington Martin. Okay, and I just want to, obviously, I know y'all thinking, but just shout out to all of tomorrow because it was yeah, well put together. Man. Appreciate y'all, man. That was amazing. Especially as late as that had to come about with as many kids. It was the day before? Day before, yeah, like day before, day before. Found out and had all school. those kids, all that stuff. A lot of stuff had to get, get yeah. moved. So, what made y'all come together to put that camp on for the community and the kids? What, what was that conversation like in the beginning? Like, hey, let's do this. What, what took place? That was uh, that was easy. That was a uh, shine tough in the darkness. Mm -hmm. um, that was Tyler's entire idea, um, and kind of I kind of brought a little sauce in it wanting to add the inner city kids. Yeah. You know, uh, a lot of people in Allen and McKinney, they have football camps. All the time. Um, we do, we also have football camps in Dallas in the inner city, but it's usually like a bunch of kids just running around. around. Basically like what uh, Crabtree's camp and you just run around for the three hours Correct. and go through, not what y'all did, but yeah. really pushing those kids to compete the, and These get kids better. never ran a 40. Tyler's like, oh, they, they don't know how to run a 40 yard. Oh, we finna put them on a laser. You know, mm -hmm. these kids are kids who's never d done these techniques. You know, never punched bags and in, in the sand, and worked out in the sand. Mm -hmm. You know, these are these are, and they they have the capability of doing it. You know, so that was the big thing, and also a uh, small compete within each other. Yeah, you know, we wanted to to teach what we know, what we can share with the game, and also outside of the game, especially mm -hmm. with people like Steve writing his own book, yeah, you know, having his own athletic gear. Like, hey, mm -hmm. look, guys, you don't have to make money playing football. You can make money training kids. Yeah. You know, you can make money giving athletic gear. Mm -hmm. 
you know, there, there's other ways to to be a part of football without physically playing the sport. 100. percent What? What? So he said that was mostly your idea. So where did that come to you from, Pat? I mean, we both just care about the community. Mm-hmm. Care about giving back to kids. You know what I mean? Trying to help them succeed in life and avoid some of the pitfalls that we went through. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um, that's just a big deal, man. They, you know, they say all the time, our people perish from a lack of knowledge. So when we put, we're in a place that we have that knowledge now or some of that knowledge, why are we not giving it back? You know what I mean? Why are we not telling these kids what to do and what they shouldn't do? You know what I mean? There, there comes a point where, you know, a kid can't make certain decisions because their mind isn't all the way developed. You know what I mean? We've grown. You know you've grown. We've grown so many stages in life. Yeah. You know what I mean? So for to give those kids back that knowledge, like, like basic stuff, running a 40, they got the same foot and same, same hand. I had a kid literally do that this weekend. I said, hey, if you do that and a coach corrects you mm-hmm. on that and they ask you where you train at, please don't tell them. Don't, <laughs> yeah. don't ever do that again. <laughs> but that was knowledge I had to give him right. because he did not know him. And at these camps, you're able to teach these kids. So when they do get in front of the KUs and the Texas Techs or Bamas of the world, they're prepared for an opportunity. Right, and it's just it's just those little things, bro. How I, I, I know a few athletes that didn't make it just because they weren't polished enough. Mm-hmm. It's simple things, bro. So it's like any opportunity we can we can give to a kid to make something out of their lives, yes. you know, that's what we want to do. And that was just a, that's just part of it. The football aspect, the football camp is just part of it. Yeah. You know, so. And, and you know, and again, back to the account, we didn't want it to be just just they like they're just running out there. We wanted those kids to compete. You had guys yeah. out there running a four two. Yeah, yeah, boys was moving. You know, people out there. Well, we went three hours over the camp time doing that uh, tournament at the end. Like, we had to shut it down and actually (laughs) come up with a way to finish it because we was going that hard. Yeah. You know, I I think it's just, it's important to show them, like, hey, look, you guys are right there without the equipment. You're Mm -hmm. you're there without the, the speed drills and things like that. Imagine what you'll be like with the speed drills and mm-hmm. with the equipment, take it serious. You yeah. know? So a, a lot of it we blame the community for, but also we have to help these children and let them know that they have to do with their play, their yeah. part. So that that timing, bro. A lot, of, a lot of times we don't want to sacrifice our own time. Mm-hmm. We don't want to sacrifice our own happiness to help you know, the man next to us or the kids under us. So that's what you say, we go three hours, we don't care. We no. there, you know what I'm saying? Care. We there giving back. Um, helping these kids in any way we can, man, because we know how much, you know, this is their world now. You know, we getting old, we ain't that old, but we still. But for, for ball, we are, you know like, we're at so. the end of our lifetime as as a ball player. Right, right. so, so we got to right. start giving back, man. <laughs> 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 but, no, with, but um, with all that being said, before we wrap up everything, uh, Pat, go ahead and tell us, you know, where everybody can find you mm-hmm. and whatever you want them to know about what you have moving forward. Okay. Uh, y'all can find me on uh, Instagram at line uh, hearted underscore two six. On Twitter is line underscore hearted underscore two six. Um, and man, you guys, I really just want to be here to give information, man. Be a mentor to anybody that needs it. If you have any informa- any questions, anything you want to ask me um, in regards to football, any sport, religion, life in general, just anything, man. Feel free to message me. Um, you want to ask? You want to maybe go train or something? I might have time to go do that. I have a lot of free time on my hands right now, man. Like I had said, we're blessed in the, in the place that we are. So, anything you want to ask, anything you you think of, just come to me, man. We can talk about it. So to end up at this point, I appreciate you guys for the interview. I just want to know, and you to let the people know where they can find you and Hatch Homes and everything y'all got moving forward. So just let the people know how they can contact you if you have that information and just, you know, anything you got moving forward. Uh, contact information for me would be Instagram, Hatch Homes Realty. Uh, Hatch Homes phone number 469-427-9640. And email jhatchrealty at gmail.com. And I appreciate that. I appreciate you, appreciate T-Fat. You, I appreciate you, Big Hatch. That's episode three of TRPT COD. I hope y'all enjoyed it. Just know we're going to keep coming with all these facts, this information, this knowledge, the ups and downs. Once again, this show is designed not to 
glamorize what anybody's doing. It's for them to be real, 100% real. Like I said, we went in to T-Pat's attitude. We went in to Hatch saying he didn't work hard. We want to definitely always give what they say, everybody their roses, but we're not going to skip over the pitfalls that we all fell into. That's the bigger part of the show. Don't fall into the things we're telling you that many of us do. This is how you go around it and streamline where you're trying to go. So appreciate y'all for tuning in. Make sure y'all like us, share us.